So today we find ourselves on October 7th, uh, one year from the uh, horrific, inhuman, really, attack by Hamas upon Israel. Uh, many killed, many kidnapped, many of those who were kidnapped, some of those remain uh, hostages even today. Um, raping of women, killing of children. It was about the most inhumane display uh, that you could imagine. Horrific, demonic, satanic, uh, wicked and evil on every possible imaginable level. Celebrating it, all that kind of thing. Animals, uh, animalistic, uh, almost in, in their mindsets. It's, it's hard to even imagine humanity treating humanity that way. We've seen it throughout history and other demonically inspired kinds of uh, activities and such, but here was another one in plain view for us today. Uh, incredibly, uh, uh, organizations, no, no less the United Nations, actually finding ways to try and make it seem as though Israel is the aggressor in all of this. Uh, it's insane to think about um, the the bizarre mindset that 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 has seems to have taken over uh, the sanity of, of of people. But here we are. Uh, just by way of some summary, since that time. Um, uh, this this war has expanded pretty dramatically. Uh, what began uh, with not only a, a horrific attack by Hamas, but uh, unfortunately uh, a gaping uh, lapse in Israeli intelligence uh, has become a very different thing in modern days. Uh, matter of fact, Israel began to go after Hamas, systematically dismantling it. Uh, and in uh, just a, a short time back, really just uh, uh, maybe what, I guess I have to remember, maybe like a month ago or so, uh, Israel struck Hezbollah uh, in remarkable fashion uh, by having uh, set explosives in their communication system. Uh, their leadership among Hezbollah had, uh, had, had told all of their operatives to switch from cell phone, using cell phones, which were easy to track by Israeli intelligence, to what they thought would be technology that was less capable of being tracked by Israeli intelligence, and that was pagers. Uh, for those of you who don't know what pagers are, pagers are little boxes about the size of a, a small wallet or something that, uh, that you just get messages on to tell you to call somebody or to tell you a brief message of some kind. It's technology we used in the 90s and 80s and such. Um, so they went back to that thinking that um, this would keep them able to communicate but without being traced by the Israelis. But the Israelis, through tremendous sabotage, actually built these pagers, uh, built into these pagers explosives. And then, you know, through various companies and that, ended up being the organization that sold these pagers to Hezbollah or provided them to them somehow. And, and then at a very particular time, Israel sent a message to these pagers and exploded them all simultaneously, uh, killing a number of the Hezbollah operatives, um, injuring a great many of them, and effectively, you know, uh, massively affecting their ability to communicate together. So they then went into switching from pagers to walkie-talkies, but it turned out Israel sabotaged those as well. And so it was an absolutely masterful response to what seemed to have been a tremendous intelligence lapse to start you know, at the very beginning. Now this was uh, certainly regaining some face in, in what was a very precise, uh, efficient, and effective attack upon the Hezbollah organization. Now Hamas and Hezbollah are Iranian proxies, um, uh, and, and Iran is now involved in this conflict as well directly. Uh, for the first time in a very long time, really the first time ever, Iran uh, has launched missiles into uh, Israel in response for the, the Israel's killing of, uh, of the Hezbollah leader uh, Hassan Nasrallah. But also, too, um, Israel struck a meeting in Beirut that I think took out at least one of the Iranian guard leaders. And so Iran now finds themselves in this conflict as well. And, um, and again, because of that last missile barrage from, uh, from uh, Iran into Israel, Israel is now threatening to respond and is planning to respond, and Iran is sort of on its heels in a way, waiting for that to happen. Um, other news in that regard, uh, the Houthis have attacked Tel Aviv. Uh, I'm looking at the Jewish news syndicate, and it looks like they've launched rockets into Tel Aviv, and if this report is correct, about four million Israelis are taking cover at this time. Um, uh, adding another element to this whole thing, uh, Israel continues to supply 
uh, intelligence and materials and such to Ukraine. And so that is no doubt stoking the ire of uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia. And so naturally, all of us who are involved in studying Bible prophecy are paying a lot of attention to this. Israel, as has often been said, is the backbone of New Testament eschatology, uh, really eschatology in, in, as a whole. But it's, it's been said that if you want to know where you are on God's prophetic time clock, watch Israel. I think that's a, a good way to look at it. Um, and as believers, as Christians, I, I would full-throatedly say that we should be supportive of Israel. And what I mean by that, in acknowledging that Israel as a nation is in the land now in unbelief, we recognize that they're not walking according to their covenant relationship with God. Uh, they're certainly not following Jesus. I mean, there are Christians in uh, Israel who are ethnically Jews who have come to believe in Yeshua, the Messiah. But Israel as a nation is not following Jesus, their Messiah. Israel as a nation is not even walking according to their old covenant relationship with God. They are not a, an irreligious nation, but they are a largely secular nation. And so they're in the land in unbelief, which is to say that when we say we support Israel, we don't support everything they do, and certainly we don't support their unbelief. We don't support their rejection of Messiah. What we do mean when we say that we support Israel is that we are recognizing that they remain God's covenant and chosen people, uh, and he has his hand upon them, and will one day, after the ending of the church age, uh, he will once again work in and through Israel, very particularly as he now leads the world into uh, ultimately its conclusion, its culmination as God has deemed. And so that being said, uh, I would suggest that all Bible-believing Christians should be on the side of Israel, at least on that level. We recognize their particular place as the apple of God's eye and, his, and their particular place in his purposes and, and prophetic plans. And so that being said, what I'd like to do today um, is, is not try to make this seem like a newscast and all that. There's plenty of great places on, online to get information about what's happening right now. Uh, Amir Sarfati obviously posts very, very uh, frequently on what's going on in Israel. I just mentioned the Jewish News Syndicate. Uh, Times of Israel is another one. There, there, are, there are places you can go to get this news and find out what's happening uh, right now in, in Israel and that. Uh, that I would commend to you. Uh, what I would like to do rather today is to talk about a particular element uh, in regard to Israel and Bible prophecy, and that is God's faithfulness toward them and the promises that he has made toward them. Uh, there is a trend in the church today that is profound in its reach and, and impact, uh, and that is that most people when they think of Israel who are most believers, Christians today, it tends to be the case that most Christians today tend to think that God is done with Israel in regard to prophecy or any of those kinds of things, and the church has stepped into the role of being the recipient of God's promises and, and the fulfillment of those things that Scripture speaks of. Uh, I disagree with this wholeheartedly, completely, and I would even suggest that it's a terrible understanding of scripture. The reason that this view is held, however, is because Paul does speak about the idea of not all who are Israel are Israel. In other words, there is such a thing as spiritual Israel. In other words, those who uh, with the same faith like Abraham had uh, uh, believe and are therefore true Israel in that spiritual sense. That is true. I don't discount that at all. Uh, I think that is a very real thing that Paul is saying, although I think his particular slant on that is that even those who are ethnically Jewish are truly Jewish if they've believed in Messiah. Uh, and so that's a clear thing that anybody could understand and, 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 uh, and, and you know, integrate into our understanding of what Scripture is saying. However, what I think is often missed by those who would say that there really is no actual Israel anymore, it's just spiritual Israel, I think what is often missed is that the idea of spiritual Israel and the idea of national ethnic Israel still being part of God's purposes, plans, the apple of his eye, the centerpiece of biblical eschatology, and also the focal point of his fulfilling of his actual promises in scripture, those two concepts can coexist together and I would suggest do coexist together. Uh, just because the idea of spiritual Israel is true does not mean that God is not, not going to still work in and through his national ethnic people. As a matter of fact, um, at one point during the tribulation period, 
there will come a time when Christ returns at the end of the tribulation period, and those who look upon him whom they have pierced will come to believe. Zechariah tells us this, and they will be saved. Paul would say all Israel, or really all of those remaining Jews who have made it to that point in the tribulation, which by Zechariah 13 tells us is one third of, of Israel, will make it to that point, but they will all be saved during that period of time. So to say that God has set Israel aside is terrible theology. Uh, it, it, it ultimately undermines any kind of sound eschatology. And so it bears our time to understand some of the things that bear out God's faithfulness to his people. Uh, and so we're going to look at a few passages today to make that argument. And so if you've got your Bible ready, and as always, we hope you have your Bible ready, um, let me invite you to open to a number of passages with me. I'm going to just kind of go through what is a, uh, I would consider to be a small sampling compared to everything that would be said in the Old Testament and even the New Testament in this regard. So we're gonna look at a number of passages here. So uh, for starters, I will encourage you, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this here right now, but I would encourage you to read Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, and Genesis chapter 17. Um, the reason I won't spend a lot of time on it today is that we're about to pick up our midweek study again on Wednesday night. We're going to be moving into Genesis 12 as we make our way through the book of Genesis. So all three of these chapters are on the docket uh, as we make our way through. But let me just give a summary of each of those chapters and how they pertain to what we're talking about today. In Genesis chapter 12, God uh, makes a promise to Abraham, who he called out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And he now is beginning in Abraham a special people, uh, a unique people that will be his own chosen covenant people. And so he makes a promise to Abraham that he will, Abram really at this point, he's known as Abram in Genesis 12, he later becomes Abraham. Uh, and so he, uh, um, he's given this promise by God that he's going to become a great nation, that uh, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through his posterity. And of course, in particular, one person who will be born through the line of Abraham, and that is the Messiah, Jesus. So this promise is now first given to Abraham in Genesis chapter, Abram, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And not only that, but God says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Uh, blessing Abraham, uh, blessing those who bless Abraham, and cursing those who curse Abraham is where we get the beginnings of our reasoning for supporting the posterity of Abraham. Um, God will bless those who stand alongside, who, who, uh, who, who uh, support and that kind of thing, but he will also curse those who stand against, those who would seek their destruction and such. So I, 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 in, in the simplest terms, you want to be on the right side of that equation. Um, now, in Genesis chapter 15, God goes on to make this uh, covenant with Abraham unilateral. In other words, he, pre he presents a, uh, he, he lays out for Abraham in kind of um, dramatic fashion. He makes a covenant with Abraham in such a way as to demonstrate that the covenant promise that God makes to Abraham does not depend on Abraham or by extension his posterity's faithfulness, but it depends upon God's faithfulness alone hence unilateral. It's not bilateral. It doesn't re re uh, involve uh, or require both of them to be faithful. It just requires God to be faithful. And God will never be unfaithful. And so therefore, this covenant promise is going to stand forever because it is based upon God's faithfulness. In Genesis chapter 17, we see this, this reiterating of something that has been made known a little bit along the way, but there is this strong reiterating of the fact that the covenant that God makes with Abraham is not only to his posterity, it's not only uh, to, to his offspring down to the generations leading up to Christ uh, and even beyond, but his covenant people, but also the land itself. The promise is made to Abraham, to his descendants, and to the land of Canaan that would become known as Israel. And so these chapters are fundamental and important in understanding why it is that we can trust that God will not allow his people to be destroyed and also we can trust him at his word when he says he will be faithful. As a matter of fact, um, in Romans 11, Paul makes the argument that if God ceases to be faithful to Israel, then you and I as Christians in the modern era should probably 
be a little worried because we don't really have the assurance that he'll be faithful to us. We base our understanding of his faithfulness on how he is, un, how he is faithful even to his unfaithful people, Israel. So Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. We'll look at a few others here. Uh, again, this is only a sampling of what you could be looking into in the, in the totality of scripture. But in Jeremiah chapter 31, let me invite you to look there with me. In Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31 through verse 37, notice what uh, Jeremiah records. And, and by the way, I wanna make a point here. Um, as you're turning to Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah is, uh, is a prophet to the southern two tribes of Israel primarily, because the northern 10 tribes, uh, the no southern two tribes, the northern 10 tribes have been taken into captive to Assyria about a generation earlier, and they ultimately will just sort of be dispersed among the nations. They never reconvene, they never recoalesce into the northern 10 tribes again, uh, and, and so they're, they're sort of dispersed among the nations. The southern two tribes of Judah, on the other hand, uh, they are, they at the beginning of Jeremiah's prophecy are on the cusp of being brought into captivity. And then during Jeremiah's ministry, they are taken captive. So Jeremiah preaches before and during the, uh, the uh, captivity, the Babylonian captivity of the two Southern tribes. Um, Ezekiel and Daniel will prophesy during the, the captivity of those two tribes, uh, preaching messages of hope and restoration in that of the nation in terms of its release from their current captivity. And then after the captivity, uh, when they ultimately under Cyrus the Persian are released to go and start rebuilding the temple and Jerusalem and all these things, this takes place under the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, Haggai, um, Zechariah. You know, these are, these are who's preaching at that time. Now, what's, the reason I bring that up is because when you read these passages, uh, in the prophecies of Jeremiah. We'll look at one in Ezekiel. Uh, we'll likely touch on Daniel at some point. We'll look at some of the minor prophets. They all refer to the restoring of Israel and Judah, the two camps, the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes, long after, uh, in some cases, long after the, the northern ten tribes were taken into captivity. And so these are clearly future speaking prophecies that have not that had not yet been fulfilled during that entire era and were not actually fulfilled until 1948 when Israel came back into the land not just the two southern tribes but people from all over the nations who were who were ethnic Jews began to repatriate the land of Israel. And so we're going to see some of that here as we begin to look through this. Jeremiah again 31 in verse 31, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Again, notice, and Israel by this time already had been taken into captivity about a generation earlier. So he speaks to the two houses, okay, Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now listen to this. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of armies is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be, tra can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for, that, uh, for all that they have done says the Lord. In other words, if the sun and moon go off their tracks, if you could measure the heavens, if, if these things were possible, then so would be possible my forsaking Israel forever. But since those things are impossible, they will go on forever. You can't measure the heavens. It's impossible for you. So too, is it impossible that I should be unfaithful to my people? Okay. And who are his people? Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Israel is not a nation anymore. They were dispersed. They will be brought back and it will happen in the last days. Uh, another one, Ezekiel chapter 37. Let me start in verse 15. 
Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel and his, uh, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. Ephraim, by the way, is often a, a, uh, a term used. It's one of the tribes of, of Israel, and it's interchangeably used with the northern ten tribes of Israel. It's sometimes they're known as Ephraim, and that's in, in the case here and for all the house of Israel as companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it with the, join them, uh, with it with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick and then they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks on one which, uh, uh, which you write will be uh, in your hand before their eyes. Uh, then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Notice, there's a promise to restore the tribes all together and to bring them into the physical land of Israel, a land promised to them by God directly. And one king shall be king over them all, and they shall no longer be two nations, for they shall ever, uh, never, uh, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, uh, nor with their detestable things, nor with uh, any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from their dwelling places which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. And then they will, there shall be one people, and I will be their God. David, my servant, will be king over them. And they shall, uh, they shall have one shepherd, and they shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant. Notice the clarity of that language. Um, uh, where your fathers dwelt. In other words, the physical land of Israel. Uh, and their, uh, they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their, their God, and they shall be my people. And the nations will also know that I, the Lord, sanctify or set apart uh, Israel." Then my, uh, when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. So we see a couple of things here. First off, some of it's been fulfilled already. They are in the land together. They are not divided into two nations anymore. They are one nation reunited again in the physical land on the mountains of Israel. Not only that, but there is still to come a time when David, either this is a reference to the son of David, uh, Jesus, or David himself as one of the saints of the Old Testament who will... Uh, will enter the millennial kingdom and will likely sit alongside of Christ and such during that time, it may be that David is literally in view here. I tend to think that's the case. And so there will be a time when the tabernacle of God will be established during the millennium. We see that millennial uh, temple described in Ezekiel 40 to 48. During that period of time, all the nations will see that uh, that he is the Lord and such. And as uh, 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 as that time comes, God is doing this so that they, the nations will know he is the Lord. Even now, during this time, the era is that they uh, were living in an era where God's desire is that the nations would recognize him for who he is. We'll see that actually unfold in dramatic fashion in Ezekiel 38 and 39, where God comes to bat for his people Israel as the nations around them come against them. Uh, whether or not the conflict that's happening right now is going to lead into that or not, we'll see. Time will tell. But when it does ultimately unfold, the primary reason for its unfolding is that God may step in uh, on behalf of his people Israel and that they and then the nations who are attacking them will all know that he is the Lord. Uh, a couple of more passages here. Um, let me invite you to look at, um, got a bunch here. We'll just pick a few out for time. How about Amos chapter 9? In Amos chapter 9, we'll look at verses... Um, uh, let's just go verses 13 to 15. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills will flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel and they shall build uh, the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land and no longer uh, shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. 
Uh, one more here along the same lines in Micah, uh, chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. Um, uh, or let's go 6 to 8, actually. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast, and those whom I have afflicted, and I will make the lame a remnant, and the outcast a strong nation. Uh, so the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you it shall come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Um, so many promises like these throughout the scripture that remind us of God's faithfulness to his people Israel. It's not because they're faithful, they have generally been unfaithful throughout most of their history. Uh, there have been exceptions to that rule, but by and large that has been the case. And so here they are in unbelief, and God is still demonstrating his faithfulness by preserving them. The fact that they are in the land even now is a fulfilling of his, of his faithful promises to them. Uh, a couple of other passages just to kind of bring a few things together. Um, uh, I mentioned Daniel. Might as well look at a passage in Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 12. Notice what he says here. Uh, at that time, he's now talking about the time of the end. He will be told, uh, Daniel will be told by uh, by the angel to seal up the book of this prophecy until the time of the end. And so it's during that era that's being referred to here. And, and um, he's, Daniel's told that at that time, Michael, in other words, Michael the archangel, shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be ta a time of trouble such as never was uh, since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall, shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn uh, many to righteous, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So in other words, Michael will stand up as a, as a defender of the people of Israel, your people, Daniel, during that time. Uh, this is the same thing Jesus is talking about in, in uh, Matthew 24, 21, where he talks about how there will come a time of trouble such as never been seen uh, and, and never will be in that, as he's describing uh, the tribulation period in that. Um, one more, and this is where I'd like to finish out today, is in Romans chapter 11. Uh, I can't encourage enough that time is spent in Romans 9 through 11 in regard to this topic. Uh, of course, the passages also speak to questions about God's sovereignty and election and those kinds of things, but don't let that intimidate you from reading these, these chapters. Um, the context in which God builds this argument has to do with his covenant people. Uh, not that those principles don't engage in other areas and elements of our theology, but it's important not to divorce them from the, from the discussion about his people Israel. Chapter 9 starts with Paul pouring out his heart and his desire to see his people Israel saved. And he says that a few times along the way. And here in chapter 11, we see it once again. So I'm going to kind of skim the chapter a little bit, but I'm going to read some sections of it. In Romans chapter 11, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. This statement alone should seal the idea that, that Paul, who has already spoken about the idea of spiritual Israel, and we'll talk about it again, um, is, is talking in, in terms of the reality of that, but also the fact that national ethnic Israel is also in view, and that Israel as a people group will be saved. Not spiritual Israel, but Israel. They will effectively, national ethnic Israel in unbelief, will become part of spiritual Israel when they come to belief as well. And so again, I think that's an element that's missing among many who would sort of discount the physical national ethnic side of this and just lean entirely on the spiritual side of this. Verse two, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know that what the scripture says of Elijah, how he's pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets. He now goes on to quote, uh, uh, from the prophet, and, and but God reminds him that there's a remnant of faithful that ultimately will be spared, and 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 this is what Paul's argument here is that in similar fashion there is a remnant among Israel, physically, nationally, who will actually become spiritual Israel as well. But this will all be part and parcel to what God is doing in the last days. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the period of time that exists right now as he goes on through Romans 11 
He'll go on to describe how the reason for the church age is not only that Gentiles be saved, but also that the church, the Gentiles, and really the mixing of Jew and Gentile, Ephesians 2.14, coming together in this new entity known as the church, is intended to prod Israel to jealousy so that they too might be saved. And then he goes on to describe this idea of the vine and how Israel is in fact the true vine. And even though they've been cut off for a time so that we might be grafted in, they will be grafted back into the vine. And if we think that God's not going to be faithful to do that, then as I said earlier, you and I, and Paul's argument is that you and I should question whether or not God will be faithful to us. Will he not cut us off forever if he cut them off forever? No, he didn't cut them off forever. He's going to graft them back in. And likewise, because he's faithful to them forever, we know he'll be faithful to us forever. So um, after having gone through all of that, much more eloquently than I did, um, he goes on here and and says this um, in verse 25, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, there are a couple of different interpretations to what Paul might be meaning to say there, but one of those interpretations, and the one that I tend to lean on, is that what he's describing here is that there's a blindness upon Israel nationally and ethnically until the time of the church age is over. In other words, until the time that the Gentiles are being uh, have been being grafted into the vine here, that time's going to end. And when it does, then the blindness will be lifted. And once again, God will begin to work through Israel. It goes on in verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. And by the way, all Israel here would pertain again, as I mentioned in Zechariah 13, a third of Israel who survives the tribulation. Two thirds ultimately will uh, be destroyed under the time of Antichrist, but ultimately one third uh, will, be, will survive and see the return of Messiah and will come to believe in him. Now, by the way, in this regard, I would encourage you to go ahead and read uh, Revelation chapter 12, where uh, the Antichrist, as, in, as, as fueled by Satan the dragon, drives Israel off to run for its life in the wilderness, but ultimately they will be delivered by Messiah when he returns. I'd also encourage you reading uh, Zechariah 13 as we have referenced it. Uh, he goes on. Um, um, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is the covenant, uh, my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But now who's he talking about? He's talking about Israel. He's talking about Jews being the enemies of the cross for the gospel's sake. He is therefore, they are therefore against the Christians for the gospel's sake, both because they don't believe it, but also because it is the gospel that saves us that is prodding them to jealousy. It goes on. Um, uh, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And here we go. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So, what God has promised to his national ethnic people, he will be faithful to perform that. He will not be unfaithful. In, in fact, all of this talk uh, about the nation coming back, the 10 tribes in the north, the southern two tribes being brought together in one stick, back in the mountains of Israel, all these kinds of things, these things would be proven untrue if that didn't happen, which means God would not have been faithful and we could not take him at his word. The fact that Israel's back in the land in 1948 would seem to be abundantly providing uh, for the fact that God, proving the fact that God is faithful to do what he said he will do, especially in regard to his covenant people Israel. Now, if he was faithful to do that, we should be expecting him to be faithful to fulfill all of the other things that pertain to them. There will one day be a... uh, um, uh, a coming kingdom that Jesus himself taught us to pray for. Remember he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that. Um, uh, when all of the prophets in the Old Testament talk about this coming kingdom, this coming time of of, of peace and, and blessedness and that under the, the rule of Messiah, we should not see that as figurative. We should see that as being just plainly speaking about what it's going to be like. When Paul uh, or John uh, or Jesus talk about uh, the events that take place in and around this coming world leader known as the Antichrist, uh, who will uh, step into the temple of God, meaning there must be a temple during that time, and declares himself to be God, demanding to be worshipped and such. 
um, then an image will be built in his honor and, and the world will be forced to bow down and worship it and take a mark of allegiance uh, that, that, that is an act of worship toward him, but also a, a measure that is taken to gain entrance to the economy and political system of that time. Uh, it is uh, when the Bible talks about these things, yes, there are, there are places where clearly some imagery is being used or some allegory in some cases. Um, but the explanation of these things is typically found throughout Scripture. We can, we can have a good, sound understanding of very, very much of this. So we should not be quick to sort of allegorize it. And therefore, the, the, the effect of that is to, to not be looking for these things, is to feel as though that these things shouldn't be looked for because they're not meant to be taken literally or seriously even. I just think that's bad theology, certainly bad eschatology. But I think as a general rule, from even a, a full scope theological perspective that's just a terrible way to go about reading your bible and trying to understand it and so um, again as we uh, kind of bring this in for a close um, here on uh, you know a year later uh, as as israel has as the bible said become a focus upon which all the world is setting its eyes um, it 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 is wise for us to be watching and looking at that and simultaneously because of those things be looking up for the coming of the Lord to catch up his bride and to ultimately then fulfill all of the rest of, of what uh, the scriptures say about the last days. Um, we, we would be unwise to say, my master delays his coming. We would be unwise to uh, see these things as just having nothing to do with scripture. They are so plainly having something to do with scripture. Um, that we and we don't want to fall into the same mistake that the Pharisees made when Jesus condemned them for being able to tell the signs of the weather, but not being able to understand, recognize, discern the signs of the times they were living in regard to his first coming. I think we should be wise to not make that mistake when it comes to his second coming. So that being said, continue to pray for the peace of uh, Jerusalem. Um, continue to um, um, keep your eye on the news. Most of all, though, be sure to keep your eye on the Word of God because this is the lens by which we gain understanding to what's happening in the world around us today. Uh, there is no more contemporary commentary on, on world events than the Scripture itself. We want to make sure we don't read into the Scripture, but when the Scripture has given us in advance uh, a, a description of what's going to happen and we see it happening, that, that should cause us to wake up and to realize that we're getting closer and closer. And then, of course, as Peter says, you know, what, what kind of living in holiness should that prod if we, in fact, are looking for these things to come? If we're not looking for them to come, it's no surprise that we wouldn't necessarily be prodded to live in holiness. But if we know he's coming, the natural response to that is, oh, okay, well, man, I better make sure my, uh, when he comes, I'm not doing something stupid. You know, I want to make sure that I'm about his business when he, when he comes for me. And so, uh, I mean, that should be the motivation of a Christian anyway, because any one of us could die at any moment and see him. But considering all that the scriptures say about the dramatic sweep of his coming when every eye will see him in the second coming but what about when that trumpet sounds and we're caught up to meet him in the air we don't know when that's going to be so we should be about his business just constantly living in the expectation the things we see out there are intended to peak us and to get us looking and thinking and realizing um, that, that we're getting close As a matter of fact it's it's ironic uh, how much of the church is discounting all of that but how much of the world is saying something's going on something just feels weird like what this this seems biblical in some way it's 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 the unbelievers who are saying this seems biblical um and i think the church should see that as an opportunity to give a good sound exposition on what the scriptures have to say about these things so that we are uh, as part of the gospel so that we are about the lord's business and bringing people into the kingdom of god before it ultimately comes and arrives so um so thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and, um, and do continue again to pray for Israel. We pray for the salvation of all of those in the region, not just Israel, but, um, but we do pray that God will fulfill his, his, his predetermined, pre-spoken of and revealed plans and purposes, that he be glorified through these things, and that, like he so often says, they may know that he is the Lord. Father, we thank you and praise you and uh, just ask that you would accomplish your purposes. You'd help us to be mindful of them and aware of them and responsive to them. Uh, we pray, Father, that our sense of priority would be uh, about your sense of priority in terms of eternity and, and, um, and being used by you as your hands and feet, your mouthpieces, uh, to bring the gospel to a lost and, and rebellious world. 
um, that needs to hear from the ambassadors of Christ, uh, whose citizenship is in heaven, um, explaining like what is coming from our mother country, as it were, here to this place. Because one day, all of the nations of this world will become uh, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. We know that that is coming. Jesus told us to pray for it. It is a sure thing. It will one day come. And so, Father, for our part, as your ambassadors, help us to be about the business of bringing that message of reconciliation, pleading with those around us to come and be reconciled to God. So thank you for that calling. Thank you for what is yet to come, the future and the hope that you've given us. And we look forward to the day when we can ultimately be caught up to meet our bridegroom in the air and ever be with the Lord. So thank you, Father. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem here on this day as we remember uh, what happened a year ago. Uh, and Father, recognize that Israel is the centerpiece. That is the focus. It is uh, the place that has the gaze of the entire world upon it. And one day it will be through that, uh, that very small nation that is so central to your purposes and your heart uh, will one day become uh, the, the ground zero for you making yourself known to the world around us, uh, even as it was when Christ came. But uh, we just are thankful to know about these things in advance. So we love you, we praise you, and we bless you, and we give ourselves over afresh to you for your plans and your purposes until Jesus comes. And we ask this in his name. Amen. <laughs>